This is Episode 3 of The Alien Agenda. If you missed precious episodes, a link to the playlist can be found in the comments section. The second crash after the Roswell incident was reported on the Texas-Mexico border, also in New Mexico. The remnants of the spacecraft were taken to one of the bases designated for such cases. In a document signed by Admiral Hillencooter, it was stated as follows. On December 6, 1950, a second object, possibly of similar origin, traveled at high speed over a long trajectory in the atmosphere before crashing in the El Indio Guerrero area near the Texas-Mexico border. By the time the research team arrived, all that remained of the object had almost entirely burned. The remaining materials were sent for study to the Atomic Energy Commission base in Sandia, New Mexico. The object was initially detected by radar in Washington State, which showed it was moving southeast at a speed of 4,000 kilometers per hour. An F-94 fighter recorded its crash location, about 50 kilometers from Del Rio, on the Mexican side of the border. Mexican soldiers guarded the site until U.S. Air Force representatives arrived. According to reports, the metallic disc was about 30 meters in diameter and 9 meters in height, but was severely damaged by an explosion and fire. Inside, they discovered the body of a creature about 140 centimeters tall, with a large, hairless head, and four fingers on each hand, dressed in a metallic fabric suit. Several other bodies were reportedly found. After photographing the crash site, the U.S. Air Force transported the remains for study. For secrecy, authorities launched a cover story that the object might be debris from a V-2 rocket launched from the White Sands test site with a monkey inside a capsule. However, the UFO crash site was 500 kilometers from the test range, while the V-2's range didn't exceed 300 kilometers. U.S. ufologists also obtained two negative photos of the creature taken by a Navy photographer who shot the crash site. An indirect confirmation of the authenticity of this case was found in U.S. Secretary of State Marshall's appeal, on which he asked the Mexican government for permission to evacuate what he called the remains of an out-of-control experimental flying device. In 1951, Marshall told Dr. Alexander that he knew of three cases of forced UFO landings resulting in crew deaths and that the U.S. had acquired these objects along with the alien bodies. An FBI memorandum by Hotel from the Strategic Air Command was sent to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover on March 22, 1950. It stated, One Air Force investigator reported that three so-called flying saucers were retrieved in New Mexico. They were circular in shape, about 17 meters in diameter, with a raised center. Each contained three humanoid beings about one meter tall, dressed in metallic suits made of very thin material, similar to the anti-G suits of test pilots. It is suspected that these crashes in New Mexico were due to interference from a powerful radar system, and, perhaps not only radar, signed ELZ. The study of the remains of the flying saucers in Roswell resulted in an October 30, 1947 memo from Brigadier General George F. Shulgin, addressed to Air Force Intelligence Services. On January 29, 1984, this document was declassified under the Freedom of Information Act. Shulgin's memo included the following. Type of material. Metal. Black metal. Non-ferrous metal. Non-metal. Composite or multilayered, using various combinations of metals, metal foil, plastic, and possibly balsa wood or similar materials. Unusual manufacturing methods to achieve extraordinary lightness and structural stability. Special devices such as retractable domes provide unusual visibility for the pilot and crew members. 
unusual features or mechanisms for opening and closing doors. Landing gear, conventional, three-wheeled, multi-wheeled, unusual, tripod or tail skid. Devices for takeoff from ice, snow, sand or water. Power plant, nuclear engine, atomic energy. Nuclear engines may not resemble any known engine types, although atomic energy could be used in combination with any of the following types, piston, jet engine. The aircraft may lack a fuel delivery system or fuel storage capacity. The power plant may be an integral part of the aircraft and possibly not perceived as separate from it. Report immediately. Crashes also occurred in other regions. One of them was likely an unmanned UFO in the Dalnogorsk area of Primorsky Krai, Russia. Information about its crash and subsequent investigation eventually leaked into several publications, albeit with significant delay. The event was summarized as follows. On January 29, 1966, a glowing sphere about two meters in diameter appeared in view. It moved in leaps and then fell. Two flashes followed and a fire began, as bright as electric welding, lasting about an hour. Searches at the crash site uncovered several unusual items. First, there were small spheres with holes, consisting, as it turned out, of a lead alloy containing elements such as zirconium, lanthanum, yttrium, and praseodymium. Another group of spheres, coated with glass-like droplets, was found to consist of iron alloys with chromium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum, as well as tungsten and cobalt. There were also particles called meshes, which appeared as a black glass-like mass riddled with holes. The remains were studied in various scientific and research centers. Scientists at the Tomsk Polytechnic Institute discovered that the meshes contained a large group of elements from the Mendeleev table and exhibited unusual properties. They did not dissolve in the strongest acids, burned entirely at 900 degrees Celsius, but did not melt in a vacuum even at 2,000 degrees. When cold, they were non-conductive, but when heated, they became conductors. Quartz filaments about 17 microns thick three times thinner than a human hair, were found inside the mass. Some were twisted into bundles, and one contained a fine gold vein. The fact that the meshes changed properties when heating puzzled scientists. X-ray structural analysis initially showed gold, silver, and nickel, but these elements disappeared after heating, while molybdenum and beryllium sulfide, previously absent, appeared. Dr. Vysotsky, a chemistry doctor, stated, This sample is undoubtedly of non-natural or non-terrestrial origin, a product of very advanced technology. Magnetized silicon schists were also found at the crash site, although it was believed that silicon could not be magnetized. Studies in 1989 by V. Gernick, an expert in geological and mineralogical sciences, and E. Gorshkov, an expert in physical and mathematical sciences, showed that magnetization occurred under an artificial magnetic field two orders of magnitude stronger than Earth's. Eight days after the incident, UFOs again flew over the crash site. Crashes were also reported over Soviet territory in 1979 in the Khabarovsk Krai and Kazakhstan in 1987 in Kabardino balkaria and several other locations. There were also reports of UFO crashes in Spitsbergen, Norway, and in Argentina, South Africa, China, and other countries. In most cases, the debris was transferred to the United States and concentrated at the Wright-Patterson base. Reports of a UFO crash on Spitsbergen first appeared in Germany and only later in Norway, which owns the island. On June 28, 1952, the Saarbrücker Zeitung reported that Norwegian pilots had found a flying saucer on Spitsbergen, presumably crashed in April 1952. 
The disc measured 46 meters in diameter. Its circumference housed 48 rocket engines, presumably meant to spin the saucer around its axis. The Norwegians invited U.S. and British representatives to investigate. For three years, no comments were made on the event. Silence was broken only in 1955, again in Germany, when the Stuttgarter Tagesblatt reported, Oslo, Norway, September 4, 1955. Only now is the Norwegian Research Department preparing to publish findings on the UFO wreckage that crashed on Spitsbergen, presumably in early 1952. During an Air Force briefing, Department Head Colonel G. Dornbill said, the Spitsbergen disk crash was of great significance. While today's scientific knowledge doesn't solve all the mysteries, I am sure these Spitsbergen fragments will prove invaluable. Some time ago, a misunderstanding caused rumors that the disk was of Soviet origin, but we categorically state that it was not built in any country on Earth. The materials used in its construction are unknown to any expert involved in the investigation. Colonel Dornbill added that the research department did not intend to publish a detailed report until certain facts were discussed with American and British experts. It was not specified whether the device was unmanned. A detailed description exists of a crash in the Tarija province in Bolivia, near the mining town of La Marmora. Hundreds of witnesses reported that on May 6, 1978, a brightly lit cylinder with a cone-shaped front flew over them at high speed. It moved at an altitude of 90 meters with a piercing whistle before crashing into the slope of Mount El Ter. The resulting explosion, visible from 150 kilometers away, shattered windows up to 70 kilometers away and left a crater 1,500 meters long and 400 meters deep. The area was declared restricted, and a special commission soon found the deformed cylinder-shaped object on the mountain slope. Helicopters lifted it with cables to the Bolivian airport, from where an American Hercules 130 plane transported it to a U.S. base. The initial skepticism of U.S. officials sharply declined after the mass appearance of UFOs over Washington, D.C. From July to August 1952, UFO groups appeared over Washington and its surroundings seven times. On the night of August 13, 68 objects appeared in the sky simultaneously, as attested to by Frank Edwards, author of Flying Saucers, Serious Business. The regular appearance of UFOs over nuclear plants in New Mexico was especially alarming. Hovering UFOs were also reported in other locations. In 1947 in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. In 1949 in Hanford, Washington. In 1950 in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And in Las Vegas, Nevada. In 1959 in Weldon Springs. The Air Force Office of Special Investigations also reported five UFO landings on the Sandia Test Center grounds in New Mexico. As a result, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff issued a series of directives to collect information on visitors and prevent an armed attack on the United States. These directives, titled JANAP-146, were revised and reissued several times. In September 1951, March 1954, and March 1960, they prohibited the disclosure of obtained observation data under penalty of espionage charges. Similar instructions, AFR 200, were issued by the Air Force, as it was primarily responsible for monitoring UFOs in the air. In the Air Force instruction, AFR AR 200, dated August 12, 1954, it states that flying objects do not pose a threat to the United States and its power. However, it clarifies that information on sightings and characteristics of these objects should be reported to alert centers immediately. All UFO reports to these points were to carry the UFOB code. 
In a letter from General Schweitzer of the U.S. National Security Council addressed to von Kavitsky, he warned of the potential danger UFOs might pose to the safety and defense of the United States. Coleman von Kavitsky was a member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He also led ICUFON, the Intercontinental Network for Research and Analysis of UFO and Galactic Ships, and was a member of the UN Secretariat. Here is the letter in full. Letter from General Schweitzer to von Kavitsky. National Security Council. Washington, D.C. 20506. November 21st, 1981. Dear General von Kavitsky, Thank you for your kind letter which arrived during a challenging time. I regret the delay in response, which was due to circumstances and a high volume of correspondence. The President is well informed of the threat you so vividly document and is doing everything in his power to swiftly and cautiously seek options within national defense to ensure security. Sincerely, Robert L. Schweitzer, Major General, U.S. Army. The letter refers to two EQFON memoranda, which von Kavitsky sent to President Reagan in January 1981. They contained 20 declassified government documents on the actions taken by armed forces in various countries concerning threats to Earth's civilization. Schweitzer, the president's chief military advisor on national security, was soon dismissed without explanation. Most likely, this was because he publicly commented on a subject strictly tabooed in the U.S., despite the fact that by then, the reality of UFOs no longer raised doubts among U.S. leaders. The matter likely went further, as UFO research was acquiring increasingly strategic importance for the U.S. Some believe that many technological breakthroughs in the U.S. stemmed from discoveries at UFO crash sites, Experts attribute this to the achievements of Silicon Valley, the hub of America's global computer advancements. Could this explain U.S. commitment to the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars program, for which it sacrificed the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty? In the U.S. Air Force Academy textbook Introduction to Space Science, it states, the most understandable theory is that UFOs are material objects with either crews or remote control, considered extraterrestrial for our planet. The best approach when encountering them is to be vigilant, attentive, and avoid extreme measures. Here, a cautious yet constructive approach to extraterrestrials is evident, raising the question, had this approach yielded concrete results by that time? In other words, had they managed to capture some members of the spacecraft alive, who then agreed to cooperate with the U.S. authorities, sharing their knowledge and secrets? The fact that one of the craft fell into American hands fully intact suggests that U.S. military officials would have tested it in operation. Indeed, the test project was called Snowbird. Trials of the alien ship were scheduled in Nevada. Meanwhile, Project Sigma, aimed at establishing contact with extraterrestrials, became an independent, highly classified project in 1976. It appears such a test took place. Of particular note is a document dated May 7, 1979, coded Silver Diamond. It details how an unidentified flying object with humanoids on board was shot down over South Africa. Many denials have been made regarding this incident, especially concerning the laser weapon purportedly used to down the craft. However, denials are frequent in the UFO field. Nonetheless, this document merits readers' attention, so I provide the final part unaltered. Incident Description At 1345 on May 7, 1989, the South African Navy frigate S.A. Tafelberg reported to Navy headquarters in Cape Town that a UFO had been detected on the frigate's radar, traveling northwest toward the African continent 
at an estimated speed of 5,746 nautical miles per hour. Navy headquarters confirmed that the object had been detected by both aircraft radar and ground radar at Milan International Airport in Cape Town. The object entered South African airspace at 1352, but attempts to establish radio contact were unsuccessful. The Valhalla Air Base was alerted, and two Mirage F-11 Sea Fighters were scrambled to intercept the object. Suddenly, the object changed direction at high speed in a way that would be impossible for an airplane, likely turning at a 90-degree angle as seen with many UFOs. At 1359, squadron leader Goosen reported that he had visual contact with the object, which was also being tracked by the aircraft radar. He was ordered to fire on the object using an experimental onboard laser cannon, Thor-2, which he did. Squadron leader Goosen reported that the object emitted several blinding flashes and lost stability, continuing northward. At 1402, it was reported that the object was losing altitude at a rate of 3,000 feet per minute. Then, it suddenly pitched and, at a 25-degree angle, crashed 80 kilometer north of the Botswana border in the central part of the Kalahari Desert. Squadron leader Goosen was ordered to patrol the crash area until the object was secured. A team of Air Force intelligence officers, medical personnel, and technicians was promptly dispatched to the crash site for investigation and retrieval. The following findings were recorded. A crater with a diameter of 150 meters and a depth of 12 meters. A silver disc-shaped object embedded in the crater's slope at a 45-degree angle. The sand and rocks around the object had been melted by intense heat. Strong magnetic and radioactive emissions around the object disabled the group's electronic equipment. The team leader decided to transport the object to a secret Air Force base for further investigation, and this was done. The crash area was filled with sand and rubble to conceal all traces of the incident. Report on the secret Air Force base. Object type. Unknown. Presumably extraterrestrial. Origin. Unknown. Presumably extraterrestrial. Identification marks. None. Distinctive features imprinted on the metal hull. Size. 20 yards in diameter. Height. 9.5 yards. Weight. 50,000 kilograms. Material. Unknown. Pending laboratory analysis. The exterior surface is flawlessly polished and silver in color. No visible seams on the outer or inner surfaces. Around the perimeter, there were 12 unevenly placed oval portholes flush with the exterior. Propulsion type. Unknown. Pending laboratory results. Notes. A hydraulic type landing device was fully deployed, possibly due to a malfunction in the electronic system or possibly as a result of the laser cannon shot. At the secret Air Force base, the research team heard a loud sound from the object and saw a slight opening of a hatch on its lower part. The opening was then widened using mechanical equipment. Two humanoid figures in tight gray suits emerged from the hatch. They were taken to an improvised Level 6 medical unit on the secret Air Force base. Various items inside the object were collected for analysis, and we are still awaiting the results of the examination of the findings. The object has been placed in a sterile environment. The description of the humanoids matched earlier reports from Wright-Patterson AFB. Height, 4 to 4.5 feet. Skin color, grayish blue, no hair. The head was disproportionately large compared to humans. Enlarged skull with dark blue markings visible around the head. Pronounced cheekbones. Large slanted eyes without pupils. Small nose with two nostrils and a small slit for a mouth with no lips. No ears. The neck was very thin. The arms were thin and long, hanging just above the knees. The hands consisted of three webbed fingers. The torso, chest, and abdomen had scaly, ribbed skin. 
Thighs were small and narrow. Legs were short and thin. No external sexual organs. Feet had three webbed toes without nails. They refused any offered food. Their communication appeared to be telepathic. A request was made to transfer both humanoids to Wright-Patterson AFB for higher-level research. The transfer took place on June 23, 1989. From the description, these humanoids differ slightly from Wright-Patterson's 1947 extraterrestrials. Three fingers on the hands and feet, instead of four, and they had nostrils. But they had similar features, large heads, widely spaced, pupilless eyes, and unique skin and clothing. Their refusal to allow blood and skin samples could be attributed to concerns for their health. In any case, their behavior indicates that they were not robots functioning without emotion, but living, intelligent beings. Stay tuned for Episode 4 of The Alien Agenda, where we look at different types of UFO and their respective abilities.